right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I know we have a whole bunch of you that that's the case for today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do 50 plus broadcasts monthly, live, free, interactive, amazing broadcasts featuring scientists and explorers from around the globe. But our favorite group to partner with, the group that we always get the biggest audience for, is the Toronto Zoo right here in my hometown of Toronto. Uh, we have done over 30 programs with them over the last few years, usually get about 3,000 kids tuning in live and after the fact, so it's always such a pleasure to highlight such amazing animals and people working to conserve species around the globe. I know we've got groups joining us on the Toronto Zoo's YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel, and on Facebook today, so wherever you're joining from, you can use the chat bar to share questions, comments. I really look forward to seeing what you guys are excited about today. Even by the standards of zoo programs, today's is pretty special. We are joined live by Mary Ellen and the zoo team in the Zoo Wildlife Health Centre. We're going to learn a little bit about wildlife health and why one health is all connected, animals, humans, and more around the globe. We are joined by two special guests as well, scientists who are going to talk about some really cool work, and then we're going to dive into a really fun Q&A session together. I hope you're as excited as I am. I can't wait to get underway, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the zoo team at the Wildlife Health Centre. Thank you so much for joining us, guys and take us away. Hi, my name is Paula and today we are in our Wildlife Health Centre. This uh, brand new centre just opened a few years ago in 2017 um, and it just shows that our commitment to the health and well-being of our animals here, that we've got this big beautiful building to be able to um, provide an, an elevated level of care for our, our precious animals. Right now we're in front of the uh, Reproductive Sciences Department, so I'm the Research Coordinator for Reproductive Sciences. Reproductive sciences and the point of having that at a zoo is really the basis of animal conservation is it's a, a combined match between animal care and you're going to hear from Annie, one of our veterinarians very soon, um, as well as reproductive success with these animals and health and the, the health of the animal and reproductive output are very much linked together. So we work very closely together and you're actually going to see in a couple minutes exactly how close we are. We're literally neighbors. So right now you're looking at, um, this is my colleague and she's uh, doing some hormone analysis. So we receive samples from all around the world. We also monitor our animals here and we do hormone measurements. So hormones are very important in, in discussing and, and monitoring the wealth or the welfare and, and health and well-being of animals in our collection and also in the wild. So right now she's actually got a fecal sample. So fecal samples, that's poop, everybody. Oh yeah, super glamorous job, that's poop. What, why do we look at that type of sample? Um, it's because it's what we call a non-invasive sample. So when you go to the doctor, um, every now and then, you sometimes you have to give some blood. They'll take a little bit of blood from you and they wanna do a, a profile on you. They wanna look at some of your, what's going on in your body, health related. We can do that with our animals as well, but we've actually figured out how to do it in a way that doesn't involve touching the animal at all. So the animals poop, we pick it up, we bring it into our lab, and we extract the hormones from those samples. And we can do it from a variety of these non-invasive samples, feces, urine, we can do it from hair, we can do it from feathers. Uh, we, we've picked out a variety of different substances or materials from which we can, we can extract these hormones. So um, Christine is actually working on caribou poop that was uh, collected from wild populations. And we're going to measure something called cortisol. So cortisol is related to stress of an animal. And there are a variety of reasons why you would have a stress response. You might have it because it's that time of year. It's a, it's a breeding time of year and maybe animals are coming together. So there's a heightened excitement that will cause a release of cortisol. Maybe they're a little bit stressed because some populations are closer to human populations than, than others. And that might cause a little bit of stress. So we monitor cortisol um, in, these, in these particular samples as a way of monitoring the wild populations and how they're doing out there. We can also look at other hormones related to reproduction. So um, that would be testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, um, we can look at pregnancy rates in our population. So in, in our animals here, we can look for, uh, at post-breeding, we can look for, for pregnancy. Um, but we can also do that with wild populations. So they'll send fecal samples to us and we can say the percentage of, of, a, of a population of a particular species, how many are pregnant and how many are not. That's just a little snippet of some of the information that we can glean from doing this type of stuff. 
If we keep walking down here, we're, you're going to see now we're neighboring, we're going into the Wildlife Health Center where the veterinarian technicians work. And this is the start of the animal health level of what, we're, what we do here at the Toronto Zoo. So in the labs, they'll also collect samples like fecal samples or poop samples or urine. Um, they can look at serum. And in this case, they're looking for things like in the feces, they're looking for possibly parasites or um, you know, markers in the fecals that might indicate uh, health and well-being of an animal if, if there's an issue that happens to arrive, or even just as a regular routine health check. So they'll do that here in these labs. We can look at, we can take serum samples and look at um, blood and um, get some, just like you would do when you go to the doctors, I mentioned earlier, you might have to give a little bit of blood to, do, to take a look at uh, things that are going on in your body. The, vets, the vet technicians will do the same thing here in that lab in, in here. We're passing by this monitor that has to do with uh, nutrition. Nutrition is critical to an animal welfare, animal well-being as well. So providing them with an amazing um, quality of life, great food um, is important. That's, that's the contribution that our nutrition department um, provides. They take care of diets for all of our animals, which are individualized for each, every animal we have has their own individual diet and our nutrition team takes care of that. They also do quite a bit of research to make sure that they're providing the best mix of, of nutrients for each individual species, and the requirements are unique for all of them. So as we keep going down along here, we're gonna walk into our uh, surgery area. So this is uh, more where we, we talk about animal medicine, where this is the, the magic happens with our animal medicine. And I'm going to hand you off to Annie. She's a, one of our veterinarians here at the um, Toronto Zoo, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about wildlife health and care. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for that, Paula. My name is Annie. I'm one of the veterinarians here at the Toronto Zoo. Hope you guys are having a great spring break. I know just beginning, weather's not great, but it is warmer than it used to be. And just like you, a lot of the animals are a lot happier now that the weather has warmed up, they're getting out more. But for us, the vet staff, Spring also means that animals are getting their annual health checks. So what we usually do is, unless there's an illness or there's an actual issue with an animal, we check them at least once or twice a year. And that usually can occur in here in this area or sometimes actually on site. So the animals don't always have to leave their enclosures, which usually is a little less stressful for them and it is a little nicer. Um, so just uh, to show about this area, this is the surgery suite. So what happens is if there is an animal that is quite sick and it might need a procedure, um, this is normally where we take them into this room. It's usually kept very, very clean and we have to maintain that so that we keep the animals as clean as we can before, during, as well as after surgery. So we can, they have the best chance of improving and getting back to their original selves and everyone's all happy. Um, so let's move on to the next room. So this is our main treatment room. Um, this is actually a lot of times where a lot of our health checks occur, actually this and the neighboring room. Um, when we do have an animal that is sick, sometimes we'll bring them in here. Sometimes they are awake when they come in here and we can do some of these health checks awake. So, um, animals like turtles, like some snakes and some birds that are trained very well by our, our amazing zookeepers who are able to actually do their exam when they are awake. So, you know, we'll check just like how you go to the doctor. Um, you know, if we have an animal in, we'll check their teeth, we'll check their beaks, um, we'll check, you know, their body, see how, see how much um, fat stores they have. We want to make sure they're not too chubby, but they're also not too skinny. You know, we want them to have um, the healthiest, uh, to be the healthiest that they can be. Um, and as well as Paula had mentioned, this is also sometimes where we actually collect a lot of the samples that sometimes we pass on to the repro department. Um, so samples like blood um, that we can get from different locations depending on the animal. Um, we'll get, of course, the poop, which is not <laughs> the nicest thing, but it, it tells us so very much and is such a helpful, um, helpful sample to get as well as urine and sometimes to other you know swabs if an animal's mouth if it looks a little red and a little abnormal we'll take a sample of that and see how that looks so as here you can see on the screen we're actually doing an exam on a fish and the fish is asleep um, you can see its gills moving but it's actually asleep and we're just doing a quick exam on it um, so that's actually a lot of that occurs in this room 
you want to move on to the next room, which is a little small, but you can see a little bit into. This is where our diagnostic room is. So we actually take a lot of um, x-rays and do ultrasound. So what that is, is kind of like Superman, except we can't do it with our eyes. Our x-ray machine can see into the animal. So we can actually see inside what it looks like. So as you can see from this picture right here, this turtle actually has quite a few eggs inside her. Um, so that's actually part of the uh, health checks that we do sometimes is just to see how our animals are doing, if we are expecting some babies so that our zookeepers can prepare for them and make sure that they have the best chance of hatching and, um, and we, we get them going right away the minute they are, they are good to go. Um, with our ultrasound, what that is is basically sending a type of sound through our animals and that gives us a different picture compared to the x-rays. Um, we're able to see some different aspects, like if you have a belly ache, um, sometimes you go to a doctor, they may put an ultrasound on you, and that just helps to see kind of in real time um, how things are moving, if your belly, if all the food is moving well, um, how much, you know, if we're collecting a urine sample, um, sometimes we might want to see how much urine's in the bladder, how big it is, where it is, so that we're able to get the best sample that we can. Um, apart from that, a lot of the health checks include things like vaccination. You know, when you go to the doctor and you get your annual shots, we definitely do that for our animals as well. Um, we want to make sure, especially because a lot of our animals are, you know, housed inside and outside. We have wildlife coming through, wild birds, we have raccoons, we have squirrels. So we want to make sure that our animals stay as, as healthy as they can and we protect them to the best that we can. Um, and I think that's it for me from today. Jesse, I will swing things back to you for the next speaker. Thanks so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much. And what a neat whistle stop tour of some of the cool things you guys are doing in the Zoo Health Lab. I want to stress too, we have over 500 people tuning in from around the world today. We've got at least 20 classrooms joining in from across North America and beyond. So such a thrill having such a wide audience today. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for joining. For our two guest speakers, we're going to start with Dr. Christina Guzzo. She is joining us from UTSC, the Scarborough campus of the University of Toronto. I'm really excited to dive in with her joining us for the very first time on the broadcast. Christina, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, I am someone who uh, works at the university as a scientist, I'm a researcher, and what I do is I study viruses in specific. And so what I thought today I would share with you what we as scientists can learn from animals to help protect humans and human health. So what is a virus? So shown here is a picture of a cell in purple, a big immune cell that is so small you can't see it with your eye. You need to use a microscope. It's one of those building blocks of our human bodies. And in yellow are viruses, teeny tiny little particles. They're about 100 times smaller than a cell. And here you can see they're covering the surface of the cell trying to find a way to enter, to get inside. And so viruses are really, really different in the sense that they cannot live on their own. They need to get inside of a cell to make more of themselves, to replicate. And what happens is when viruses enter a cell, they kind of become like this thief shown here. And so what they do is they hijack the cell and they command the cell to use all of its resources, all of its energy to make more copies of the virus. And when they do that, the way that they enter the cell is a very specific way. It's kind of like a key in a lock. So shown here is one virus. So one of these yellow particles. And if we zoom in and look at the surface of the virus, you'll see that it's covered with spikes. And you can think of these spikes kind of like keys on the surface of the cell, of the virus. And so what these keys do is they look for a very specific keyhole on the cell and they try and turn and open up a door to enter the cell. And so every virus needs a very specific type of host cell, needs a very specific key and lock to enter that cell and make more copies. Now, this is kind of a golden rule that every virus needs a specific key and lock. 
But sometimes this rule can be broken, and that is when we get worried. So how does a virus survive and spread? Well, shown here is a cartoon of what we just saw on the last slide. There's our little yellow virus and our purple cell, the host cell. And what that virus does is with these spikes on its surface, it will bind to or attach to the surface of that cell. And it will try to open up that lock with the spikes and enter. And once that virus enters, it hijacks and it starts to make more copies of itself and assemble new viruses. And those new viruses then leave the cell and become free viruses to look for other cells in the body to infect. Now what happens sometimes is we get mutations. When the virus is hijacking that cell, it might make mistakes when it's starting to make new versions of itself. And when new versions of that virus arise, we call them mutants or mutations. And those mutants can be dangerous because when a mutant arises, that's when a virus might be able to infect a different type of cell, host cell. So in this case, we call this a zoonotic jump or a zoonotic virus, a virus that was originally in an animal and now has mutated or found a way to infect a human and cause disease. And that is where we get worried when these new viruses jump between animals and humans. So we can study this and we have uh, over the history of our humanity. And so what we've seen over time is that these zoonotic jumps, these zoonotic viruses, they happen all the time in many different ways. So here are examples of wildlife. So humans interacting with wildlife, maybe hunting. And we see viruses like HIV and Ebola that have come from wildlife animals and jumped into humans. It happens with domestic animals like farming, as well as wildlife farming. And it even happens with animals in live markets where viruses from those animals also jump into humans. So we see viruses like influenza, so our yearly flu that makes you sick, can come from a variety of these different zoonotic jumps. Now, you might be surprised to know that there are over 250 different zoonotic viruses that exist, 250 viruses that can go between human or animals and humans. And in fact, what might be more concerning is that there are over 1.7 million undescribed viruses that we think exist in mammals and birds and that pose a threat to jumping into humans. So what can we learn from animals to protect humans? Well, one thing that we can do is we can study viruses in these animals and try to make a prediction, try to think about or have some educated guesses of how these viruses and which ones might jump and spill over into humans. And we can rank them, those that are most dangerous, those that we're worried about the most as the high risk viruses, the high risk animal viruses that are most likely to jump into humans, or rank them into those that are low risk, those that we should be less concerned about. And we can do this, we can study, or we can make these predictions a variety of different ways. We can use computer modeling. We can look at databases of research and science on animal viruses. And then even most recently, I put an example of a website here. If you'd like to go to this website, you can actually compare the risk of different animal viruses and the risk that those animal viruses might jump into humans. So this is a really cool resource that was recently published and likely fueled by the pandemic that we're currently living in. And so what these people do to create this website is they talk to different scientists like myself, those who study viruses, particularly viruses and animals. So these are experts from countries all over the world. And they ask scientists to tell us what are some of the factors, some of the characteristics that make a virus likely to spread to a human? So there are things in the host, in the animal that we worry about, things like how often the animal might interact with humans or the geography of that animal. For example, if this animal is up north in the Arctic, it's much less likely that you would have a human come into contact with that animal. 
Or we can even talk about how related that host, that animal, is to humans. So for example, a monkey virus is much more likely to infect a human, a human because humans and monkeys are very closely related. So the environment that the virus was living in a monkey is quite similar to the environment in a human. We can also look at the virus itself. So there are characteristics about viruses that make them more risky to spread in humans. So the mode of transmission, if a virus spreads just through air, just through breathing, you know, right now we're in a pandemic where a virus spreads through air, it's very easy to spread that virus. We all need to wear masks and we need to distance. That makes that virus much more risky to spill over to humans versus the virus that may only spread through the fecal route, through poop or through blood. We can also look at the environment, the environment of where that uh, virus and that host live. And so as we know, with climate change, with development, with deforestation, changing the way we use our land and the way we farm, we're pushing animals into new climates, into new habitats, and also humans are having new interactions with these animals. So what we do is we can take all of these different risk factors and calculate those viruses and animals that are most risky to spread to humans. And so it's like we can have a watch list. Which viruses should we be most worried about in animals? So you might wonder then, what do we do to look for viruses in animals? And I, it's important to report that it's not easy to do routine wildlife testing. You would have to have somebody going out into the forest, going into your backyard, into your park, and you know, collecting samples from wild animals all the time and testing that in the lab like we just saw at the zoo. And that's simply not feasible. It would cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. But it is very important. And so I think COVID-19 has taught us that we need to think of ways to look for viruses in animals and to be more watchful of that. So here's an example. This is the family of coronaviruses. Each of these, each row is a different virus, a different coronavirus in the family of coronavirus. And what you can see is that each of these viruses has a natural host in the wildlife shown here. So most of them are rodents or bats. And typically the natural host we're not too worried about. The host, that animal in the wildlife and that virus have struck a balance, knowing how to live and how to evolve and not succumb to disease. But what happens is these wildlife uh, hosts eventually can spread to an intermediate host, something that we come into contact through farming or through regular human contact. And when the virus jumps into that intermediate host, we then get really worried. We have risks of that virus now mutating in that intermediate host, becoming a different virus and being able to spread to humans. And so what you see over history is this has happened many times for coronavirus. Most recently, the pandemic we're in, but many other versions of coronaviruses have gone through intermediate animals to spread to humans. And humans are more likely to come into contact with these animals than the natural host. And that's where we get worried. A faster rate of mutation, the virus changes in these intermediate animals. And if any of these animals happen to be endangered, we're at further risk of losing that species on Earth because they will fall sick to the new virus. And so what I want to show you is that although we have this natural host, these bats, for example, for our SARS coronavirus, and then we have the intermediate hosts where that virus changes and becomes a virus that can infect humans, then humans can spread that virus to animals. And for example, minks, uh, something, an animal that is farmed by humans uh, for their fur, minks can get infected with that new virus and spread that virus back to a human. So the virus can go back and forth between animals and humans. And that's when we start running more risks of mutations, more risks of new viruses evolving. So how do we protect animals? Well, it's really important to protect them to avoid spread and mutation. So we know that you know a coronavirus, the virus that we're living with right now, can infect our pets, can infect your household animals, mice, even farmed animals. And so it's really important to treat your pets like any other family member that might get sick. If you fall ill, you don't want to spread your virus to your pet. And if your pet has the sniffles, you don't want that pet to spread the virus to other humans. 
The other thing we do, as, as your vet uh, techs have talked about from the Toronto Zoo, is that we need to vaccinate and protect animals. So just like we need to go to the doctor and have our checkups and our vaccinations, our animals need to be protected too. So there's three main points that I talked about today. I hope you'll remember. One is that animal viruses can very easily jump into humans. We call this a zoonosis, a zoonotic virus, and that can result in disease. Also, I hope you appreciate and understand that many more new human viruses are going to come from our animal friends. And so that means in our future, we're going to have more outbreaks and maybe even more pandemics in our lifetime. And therefore, it's really important to support research and scientists who are studying animal health and animal viruses to help us better respond to future human diseases. And that's all from me. Back to you. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Guzzo. And I mean, it's such a really important topic today that the feedback and the YouTube comments has been amazing. People are really keen to learn about these things, how we can help combat them. This is a field of research that's been around for decades. But of course, in the last year and a half, we've also had much more reason to be more interested in it in the years to come. And I think that it's really heartening to see the scientific and medical community en masse around the world really mobilized to try and help prevent future pandemics like COVID-19 from ever happening again. Uh, and I think it's a really heartening story that we can all sort of get behind that the, the medical establishment and just so quickly created vaccines to help combat something in such a short timeline. So it's uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing all that. What a cool story for us today. My pleasure. Dr. Guzzo. All right, we are going to go 4,000 kilometers to the west to Vancouver for our other guest speaker who has an enviable backdrop uh, and setup for his video broadcast. I think we're all getting very professional at video broadcast at this point. Um, but Rodrigo Solis is joining us. He's going to tell us a little bit of another cool story, tying it all together, highlighting the One Health aspect of today's presentation, and then we will dive in with questions of all you folks live and on YouTube. So Rodrigo, thank you so much, man. Take us away. Hey, Jesse, how are you? And have, hello, everyone. So yeah, I'm here all the way down to Vancouver, uh, luckily uh, getting some nice weather. And, and I just wanted to follow up with uh, our previous presentation. I think it was wonderful. I hope you, you felt the same way. Uh, but I want to talk about how health, animals' health, affects us humans, but not as physically, but actually how animal health enriches human spirit. So it is not only taking care of pets because then we will get sick as well. It is because if we take care of animals, our psyche, our way we think, our uh, spiritual uh, health will be uh, in good way as well. So, uh, and I mean, you just have to take a quick look anywhere in the world to any culture and you'll see, you'll see that Animals are always related to us, to humans, in a spiritual level. For example, um, oh, by the way, I didn't even uh, tell you if, if you have any questions, whatever you need, of course, we will have our Q&A session. But also, here's my my email is down there and my, my Twitter. So you can send me a Twitter and I'll be more than happy to, to talk to you. Uh, I work mainly with butterflies, with butterfly conservation, but uh, I'm also a vet. So whatever uh, comments, suggestions, or questions you might have, more than ha happy to, to talk to you. But anyway, going back. So um, if you see to any culture, like we have that relationship with animals, like that spiritual uh, feeling uh, from animals. So for example, let's go way back to the past, Egyptians, right? You just look, most of the uh, remnants of Egyptian, uh, old culture and you'll see for example here a cat right cats were worshipped and they they were a, a really central part of religion with uh with egyptians but let's not go all the way there to, to the other side of the world just here in canada right we have uh first nations right if you just see their culture it's circle around the relationship with animals and uh, just the, their totem poles the pole that you see here has a frog whale seal bear and they would give them uh, personalities. They would give them like magical uh, properties and they would represent something. So whatever was happening, uh, happening on the animal kingdom would reflect on the spirit of, of the society. So, but okay, that is like religious, like uh, magic, let's say. But it's not only that. Let's talk about, for example, the 
uh, First Nations across the prairies, right? Back in the day, they would uh, basically uh, leave out uh, the huge herds of bison just roaming, roaming widely. And even though they would rely on them and they would have to hunt them and kill them in the end, they would respect them. And they would have that, this relationship with, with, the, with the bison. And just put yourself yourselves in their shoes when the settlers came and they basically wiped out the bison across the prairies. What would you feel as a First Nation person just being there and seeing that that counterpart of you that was helping you to survive is not, no longer there? At the spiritual level, it hurts, right? So uh, th those are some old examples how it was in the past, but let's not stay there, right? In the present, and even in the present, like that we are all surrounded by technology and cities and so uh, separated from nature, we still have s some of that. For example, just in Ontario, the uh, official animal in Ontario, the common loon, right? It is still there, that connection with animals. Here where I am at British Columbia, uh, we have the spirit there, but also is uh, the, the uh, official animal and and represents a lot of what BC is. But as I told you, what I really work with right now is butterflies, especially the monarch butterfly. And I'm sure, uh, I'm pretty sure if you are around uh, Eastern Canada, you've seen this beautiful butterfly flying around in your backyards, uh, especially during summer. And if I ask anyone in, in Ontario, they will say like, oh yeah, I remember back in my childhood, childhood that I would just see monarchs all around. So that brings you back to, to your childhood. So it is still like feeding your spirit. Uh, on top of that, if, in case you don't know, the monarch migrates all the way down from Mexico, the US and Canada. So even like a political level, it represents the community between three countries, how they get together, right? So it's a really important icon. And speaking of uh, the migration, just in case you haven't heard of it, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So this is North America, uh, where you see this uh, little monarch here, well, there, that is where the monarchs spend their winter uh, from November to March. They spend their winter there uh, when things are really cold up here, they get intelligent and move down south to Mexico. They spend uh, from November to March. Then when spring comes, they start migrating north. They start migrating north and reproduce and lay their eggs across uh, Southern US. And that first generation then keeps moving north, reproduces more, so the population keeps increasing and gives way to second generation, third generation. And they just keep spreading all across North America. Uh, and it is around July, August, that actually you start seeing them here in Canada, that they reach all the way here in Canada. But those butterflies that reach Canada are not the ones that were in Mexico. They are uh, their great, great, great granddaughters. What it is so amazing, it is that those butterflies that we see here in Canada in late, uh, in late August, instead of keep reproducing, they will migrate back south to exactly the same places where their great, 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 great grandparents overwintered one year before. Nobody knows how actually they find exactly the same forests. Uh, I even get lost in my neighborhood and these guys, they just find the same patches of forest across the whole continent. But not only that, think about just this spectacle of having the whole population of butterflies spread across the US and Canada getting concentrated down in Mexico in just a few patches of forest. So those patches of forest, just for you to think, in one hectare, which is roughly like uh, two football fields, in that somewhat small space, you can see 100 million butterflies on top of you. That is three times the population of Canada. So that in itself is amazing. It's, uh, wow. But what is also and relates back to culture and we were that we were uh, talking before, the monarchs arrive down to Mexico exactly on November the second, 
which for Mexican culture, it is uh, what we call the day of the death. When we celebrate, in me the Mexican culture celebrate their dead ones. When uh, the traditional belief says that the souls of the dead, they come back to visit us and to comfort us and to be with us uh, during those days. Uh, so, as I was telling you, that concentration, so 20 years, the, uh, during the 95, 96, uh, 1995, 1996 season, it was 18 hectares, which is roughly like 44 football fields of just monarchs. It was quite a large number. The worst season ever, this one, was just 0.69 hectares, which is like roughly a bit, le a bit less than one than two football fields. So they just decreased a lot. And just think for a moment, what does could that mean for a person that actually believes in this uh, tradition? The souls of their dead are not coming anymore. That is actually hurting your spirit, right? So on top of uh, just the value of the, the, the species by themselves, it is also what they represent to us that we have to take care of. Um, especially with the monarch, the main problem, it is the monarch relies on this plant that you see here, milkweed. Uh, the monarchs lay their eggs on top of this plant to give birth to, oh, I am covering it, but anyway, to that larvae. And they only can do it on this plant. But this plant uh, is considered a weed by farmers. So uh, when you consume products that are genetically modified, GMOs, indirectly, like you are not, not contributing to take care of, of the monarch. So just try to stay away from GMO products, try to provide some habitat, some milkweed to you in your backyard to, you, to the monarchs. Uh, so you can keep this amazing tradition. And uh, I think that's all that I have now for you guys. So go back to you, Jesse. Rodrigo, that was beautiful. We almost have never had someone talk about the spiritual aspect and the reverence for wildlife uh, ever in the history of the broadcast. So I really personally appreciate that. The last trip I went on before the pandemic hit was to Mexico to see those butterflies, something I'd wanted to do since I was a very little kid. Um, and so it's so neat to get to showcase that story today. Thank you so, so much. Um, Guys, this has been so much fun. Uh, we've sort of covered the gamut of a whole bunch of topics. Uh, we've got another 10, 15 minutes for questions. So what we're gonna do is focus on our live classes today. I know we have tons coming in on YouTube, but we're short on time. So I wanna make sure is that our, our live groups joining us from Alberta, BC, Florida, Ontario, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, and more get the chance to ask those questions. And then what I'll do is share a few resources for all our classes so you guys can learn more uh, and keep the excitement going when you're done. In fact, I'll share those first just in case classes do have to go. So briefly, the Toronto Zoo, of course, our big partner today, uh, spearheaded this whole broadcast. We're always excited to have them back. If you want to find out more about their amazing education work online, head to the torontozoo.com zoo to you site. You can also check out all our past broadcasts with them on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel. If you guys want to help protect monarch butterflies, protect pollinators in general, this is a big topic for classes around the world. Uh, the David Suzuki Foundation has the Butterfly Way Rangers Project, one of the biggest in Canada. I'm an amazing organization. Check that out. It's a really, really cool tool. And then finally, if you want to be half as excited as Rodrigo is about wildlife, and, and I am, um, we have a program at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants called Backyard Bio, where we are going to be connecting classes classrooms, eco clubs, schools around the world in showcasing all their local wildlife and reveling in what they can discover. So between social media, the iNaturalist app and those direct connections, head to backyardbio.net. All May long we're running it. It's the biggest campaign we've ever run. We'd love to have you guys involved wherever you're joining from around the world. With that, let's dive in with questions. If you have questions for Rodrigo, for Dr. Guzzo, for the zoo team, anyone you want to ask questions to, uh, they're all around with me still. Let's start with Libby joining us in Auburn, Alabama, one of our most stalwart, exciting students. Uh, Libby, if you want to unmute your mic, come on in and ask away, and we'll, we'll direct you to whoever you want to ask it for. <laughs> Hi. Right. Um, Hi. As Jesse said, my name is Libby, and I love animals. Um, how can I get involved with conservation, conserva conservation, <laughs> conservation, and helping um, animals like just live? Yeah, fantastic. The animals. We're going to save the animals together. Let's start with the Toronto Zoo team. I want to see if they have a good answer for that one. If you want to unmute your mic, guys, come on back in. 
How do we save animals together, guys? Oh, there are lots of excellent ways that you can actually help, that you can contribute to um, animal welfare, animal conservation. Um, we, there's a thing called citizen science. So speaking from a science perspective, there's this, um, a concept called citizen science where we actually go out into the public and we ask them to help us to collect data. So making observations about your favorite animals, um, find out if, you ha if there's a local team that is, that is asking for citizen sciences to go out into the field, into the wild, when you're out on your hike, um, collecting data. Did you see a particular bird? Where did you see that bird? What did it look like? Things like that. And then you send this data to the groups um, and they're collecting it and putting it together to create a big um, data set to help those species out in the wild. So that's one way that you can help. I love that answer. I mean, it speaks to what we're doing with Backyard Bio already. I brought up on the screen the iNaturalist and CCAPS. They're the ultimate tools for sharing nature observations. So wherever you are in the world, they're amazing. I'm sorry, did you have another answer for us? I thought, I think I might have interrupted you there. <laughs> I think Mary Ellen wanted to say something. Yes, yeah. just one quick other way here. If you live local to us here at the Toronto Zoo, there are lots of opportunities for zoo ambassadors and zoo volunteers for you to get involved with programs and uh, different events that we run here to help in conservation but also just by participating in our program today, by learning and listening to all of our experts today on the call and sharing that information that you've learned today, you are helping to conserve lots of species in the wild and make sure that we have a better and brighter tomorrow for everybody here on planet Earth. So just by being here today, you're already doing a small part as well. Fantastic. You got a big thumbs up from Libby for that one, Mary Ellen. Um, let's head to our, our next group. We've got Mr. LaVogue with a bajillion grade one students in North Palm Beach, Florida. Lucky him. Uh, Mr. LaVogue, if you want to share a question for us, go for it. Yeah, certainly. I'm going to combine two similar questions, and this is for the Toronto Zoo. Uh, Hassan wants to know, how do you know if an animal is sick? And Abigail wants to know, is how do you find out that that sick animal then has a virus? Um, so how do we know if our animal is sick? Um, one big thing is, like when you have a pet, you as the owner will recognize, you know, you know your cats and you know your dogs the best, so you know when, you know, Fluffy is looking a little off or maybe Fluffy's poop isn't quite looking as normal. For us, we have our zookeepers, our amazing zookeepers who are so great at their jobs and they, so, they know their animals so, so well, every individual. Um, their personalities, what they normally like to eat, what they don't like to eat, what their poops normally look like, especially if they are normally kind of abnormal. So the keepers are really great at picking that up. So when they do notice that someone's not looking quite right, um, you know, if one of our giraffes is a little lame or one of our zebras is not quite eating the normal food that he really likes to eat, they will bring it to our attention. And that's when we go and first do one visual check you know, we'll make sure that nothing is looking, nothing severe is going on. And then we'll take it from there. You know, sometimes if the animals train for a blood sample, so some of our polar bears, you know, they will actually put their paw um, out into this uh, little container and our veterinary technicians are actually able to just get a sample and our bears will just stay there and hold. And it's amazing training. That's one of the ways that we can try to figure out what else is going on. Now, from there, if we are concerned and there's something that we are worried about, then we would look into potentially doing an, uh, a sleep exam in a way. So we'll kind of put them into a sleep just so that everyone's safe and we can do the best exam that we can. And then we'll go from there and see with all the equipment, the amazing things that we can do with our technicians and we can try to figure out what's going on. Um, in terms of viruses, a lot of times it does depend on what kind of virus you're looking at. It depends on where they're sick with. You know, if a, if a snake is sneezing, which a snake should never be doing, then a sample you might be collecting is if they're sneezing and some goober comes out of their nostril, that's what you're collecting. Um, in terms of cats, sometimes, you know, our snow leopards, let's say, um, who actually are just finishing up one of their pre-shipment exams right now. So they are actually having some testing done via blood. Um, now, a lot of that with viruses, with those specific viruses, you're actually your domestic cats. Um, so your kitties at home can actually get the same virus. So that's another type of sample that we can collect to test for viruses. 
Very, very cool. Thank you so much for that. I love that snake sneezing is your go-to weird example. That was fantastic. Um, I want to bring up one quick uh, citizen science project that I forgot to mention. Rodrigo mentioned it in his talk. If you guys are keen on butterflies, eButterfly is an amazing resource. Check that out. Uh, find it on Google. Find it online really, really readily. Uh, a fantastic program for anyone who's keen to learn more about butterflies in particular. All right, we've got time for three more questions. Thank you guys so much for sticking around a little bit later than usual for us. Miss Holden in Spruce Grove, Alberta, again, one of our longest standing teachers. Come on in, take us away. Hi, Jesse. Dania is wondering if animals cry when they're hurt and how do you tell if an animal is hurt? Cry when they're hurt and how do you tell? That is a very good question. Um, depending on the animal, sometimes they can vocalize, you know. Um, some animals, like uh, maybe some of our cats and some of our hyenas, if they are painful, especially if you know, let's say one of them is limping and we want to go and just take a feel, especially if they will accept us touching them when they're awake, we might touch one area, if it feels a little swollen, it's a little painful, they might give a little yip or they might just pull their, their uh, foot back. And that's when we know that that area, whatever we have touched, is uncomfortable. So that's definitely one way that we can, we can figure out. Um, and so some animals do. Other animals, like if you have a turtle, um, they might not vocalize as much as you would think, as much as maybe a mammal would do. So in that case, then looking for signs of pain is a little bit different. Um, you are still looking for things like a reaction. So, you know, when you touch anywhere that's painful, maybe if it's a hand or, or a paw, a leg, they'll pull it back. And that's another way of, of figuring out if they're comfortable. Yeah, I love that answer. And I think, you know, for any of our people at home that have pets, you've certainly had this experience where you've seen a pet that might be in pain, might be a little bit sick. I think we all sort of have an instinctual understanding of what this is like. And it really does apply to a lot of the animals that you'd find at a zoo or aquarium as well. So very cool question, guys. All right, one more question. Ms. V's class joining us in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome in, guys, and wrap us up. What is the biggest animal in the zoo? The biggest animal in the zoo. <laughs> So um, there's definitely a couple. If you're thinking biggest as in size, I'd probably have to say it's one of our male white rhinos. Uh, we have one here named Tom. He is just under 5,000 pounds. That's about five pianos. So he's a pretty big boy. But we also have some of the tallest animals here at the zoo as well. And that would be our Maasai giraffes. Kiko, our male, he stands at just over 16 feet tall. So me as a human, I'm six feet tall. So that would be like me and then two kids or more standing on top of my shoulders. So he's a pretty tall boy. Um, and we do have our female who is a little bit shorter than him and our baby, Amani, who stands, she was born being my height at six feet tall. So she was already really big when she came into the world. So I think those would be our biggest animals we have here. That was a fantastic answer and some really inspired camera work. So thank you for that. Um, guys, this has been so much fun. I know we could probably take questions all day for Dr. Guzzo, Dr. Solis, the zoo team. Thank you guys so, so much for putting together such a special presentation with us today as we dove into zoo health, one health, viruses and how they're transmitted between animals and people and a reverence for wildlife and the amazing things that happen in Mexico every year on the Day of the Dead and with regards to monarch migration. This has been such a fun presentation and it will live on YouTube forever. If you guys are keen to tune in after the fact or share it with friends and colleagues, it will live there. So I hope you get the chance to watch later. And again, just a quick few quick resources before we wrap up. Check out the Toronto Zoo's amazing programs at zoo to you or on our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Check out our own epic global nature campaign happening all May long with BackyardBio.net. If you want to find more presentations with the Toronto Zoo and with other amazing organizations around the world, check out our website at ExploringByTheSeat.com. And finally, if you want to learn more and take action, Citizen Science is the way to go and eButterfly by Rodrigo is a really cool way of doing just that. Thank you guys so, so much. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our speakers first, and I'm going to bring in our remaining students that didn't have to run away for the end of the day. So Dr. Guzzo, Toronto Zoo Team, Rodrigo, thank you guys so much. And then Libby, Miss Holden, and Miss V, if you could join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. So